Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Justin Cormack, and I'm going to talk about um, the CNCF's project security reviews today. Um, so as, um, I'm based in Cambridge. This is a picture of Cambridge, in case anyone doesn't. Cambridge, UK. Um, it's a small tech village. And I, um, I'm a security lead at Docker, um, based in Cambridge. I'm a contributor to the CNCF's new SIG security, which we'll talk about today. And I'm a maintainer of the Notary project, which is um, a secure software update for containers project. Um, I'm Justin Cormack. I everywhere on the internet. So you can find me. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about SIG security and what it's for and what we're doing and, and, and why. Um, until a few weeks ago, it was called the Safe Working Group, and it was a sort of um, uh, sort of side project of the CNCF in a way. It was not an official project, but we um, had have meetings at uh, KubeCon for some for a while now, and we've been working towards becoming an official uh, working group, which happened um, a few weeks ago now. Um, and one of the things the um, the Technical Oversight Committee asked us to do was prepare security assessments for projects. Um, these are basically um, not penetration tests, but they're kind of detailed outlines of what the um, security relevant parts of each project, each CNCF project or each candidate project are. Um, and things that you need to know as an end user of these projects about them from a security point of view. Like, you know, do the do the goals and, and the scope of the project make sense from a security point of view? Um, you know, is it is the project sanely developed in a, you know, in a good standard? Um, it, are there any concerns about how people might use or misuse the project or, or misunderstand its use or, or anything like that? And what's the kind of security scope of a project? So this is um, what we're trying to do. So we're basically We've been starting with some security-focused projects, and then we're going to move on to the um, more general projects where security is an aspect of what they, do, what they do, and they have security pieces, but they're not specifically security-focused. So we're working on Intoto, which is planet, wants to join the CNCF. It's not a member project yet. Uh, an open policy agent we're working on at the moment as well. Um, Falco is kind of next in line, which um, is currently a sandbox project, but is looking to it switch to incubation and Keycloak, which is a proposed sandbox or a proposed incubation project, I believe. Uh, and then we'll start working on other projects after that. Uh, please feel free to participate. The processes are all open. The meetings are all open on Wednesdays. Um, and there's, we're on the CNCF Slack channel, so you can come and join us. The assessment process, um, we basically look at the overall project, look at the threat model for it, Think about the usability aspects of security, uh, risks. You know, we're not doing code audits or pen tests, so we're looking at design aspects. Um, but it's a precursor to doing a full audit, which I'll talk about the full audits in a second. Um, and it really tries to set the, the focus areas that a full audit should be targeting. Um, when we look at the audits that have happened so far, we'll see that a lot of them didn't really have an idea of what to focus on, and this was a bit of a, a problem for them. So let's talk about the actual CNCF audit. So um, the CNCF has for a while required all graduating projects to have completed an independent third-party security audit um, and published this publicly and addressed all the issues this finds. Um, and helpfully, as it's a kind of requirement, the CNCF has decided that it's going to pay for these audits as well, which is... Um, really helpful, and not just for graduating projects, but also for any project that would like one or wants to work on one. So, including sandbox projects, which um, is really nice because um, you know sandbox projects often um, are trying to explore security scape, or they're trying to get to incubation, and they you know it really helps to have you know someone come along and look at your project and say, yeah, this is doing the right thing. This project's you know. In the, going in the right direction from a security point of view, or, or not, and change, help you change the direction. Um, and audits are really normally pretty expensive. Um, when we're when at Docker, when we're commissioning audits for our projects, we normally would spend somewhere between fifty to one hundred fifty thousand euros or so, roughly. Um, 
that sort of order of magnitude of cost, depending, I mean, audits vary a lot in size and scope, so that, um, those numbers are kind of a bit hand wavy, but that's the kind of amount of money they're spending. So to, you know, this is, a, this is serious cash to back security in the, in the project, which is great. Um, we've actually had quite a lot of reviews already for the audit, so um, Envoy Cordinus, Tough and Notary Together, Prometheus Container D, Open Policy Agent, NAT. The Kubernetes one is ongoing, so I'm not really going to talk about it much. Um, it's a, I mean, Kubernetes is a huge project, and this has taken quite a lot of time, so um, it's way bigger than all the other ones, so it's, it's, it's a matter of um, months rather than weeks, um, and it's, I mean, the results are going to be really interesting when they come out, but hopefully that'll be in time for next KubeCon. Um, and Falco um, is about to start in the next month or so, so we'll have another one. I, there may be a few more as well that are coming, upcoming. Um, all, my, all of them except the Kubernetes audit were done by, so far done by a company called Cure53, who are based in Germany. Kubernetes, because it's really big, there was a kind of, um, kind of beauty contest type process to decide, and they did a joint collaboration between uh, Trail of Bits, who are based in New York, and At Redis, and the working title is Trail of At Redis. Um, um, each audit normally takes a few weeks, so like maybe three or four weeks, um, starting with a detailed code review, actually looking, you know, looking at the code, looking for potential issues, and then black box penetration testing based on things that you reckon might be an issue in the review, because it's all very well looking at the code, but you want to see, is this actually exploitable? You know, is it really seriously exploitable or just a minor issue and so on, so it helps to do that. And the kind of tools they used include things like modified clients to talk to a server with a client that's providing unexpected inputs, or modified server talking to a client and so on. Um, you know, checking protocol error handling, lots of fuzz testing against um, inputs and so on. Um, and also looking at really the common cases for the kind of protocol. So for core DNS, they looked at all the common DNS issues that historically DNS has had, you know, because there's a well-documented set of things that DNS has. And so um, I know generally, you know, there are known edge cases that are kind of common, so it's always good to look for those. Um, so obviously you just want to know, are these projects secure? You know, this is the important thing. Uh, it's not a competition. It's not a kind of, you know, the, the overall, I think, um, all the projects did pretty well. There weren't any horrendous things. Um, and actually the details are kind of more interesting in the summary. And, um, uh, but anyway, I will give you a summary. Here's a kind of summary. Um, it's not terribly, re as you can see, there aren't a lot of issues. Um, Many projects had very, very few. I've divided them, in, they were divided into vulnerabilities, which are things that are probably exploitable, especially the critical ones, and issues, which are things that you might use to ease your way into another attack later and should probably be fixed, but they're not immediately exploitable directly. Um, critical is obviously something that you can actually really exploit in a potentially serious way, um, uh, whereas low is something that it's not clear why, you know, it's not clear exactly how that fits in that, but it seems to be exploitable a little bit. Um, so there's quite a variation. We'll talk about, um, we'll talk about why Nats had a bunch of issues in, the, in a minute. Um, we'll talk about some of the common themes as well. A lot of the projects that have been reviewed are written in Go, and um, it came out quite a lot that it's hard to write bad Go compared to um, things, languages like C, and um, a lot of the time, you know, a lot of the Go code just av avoids um, a bunch of the issues that historically um, penetration testing would have found in, in, in C code. I mean, a lot of um, pen testing companies do a lot of work with C because historically that's been where there's, it's, well, it's still in the present, it's when there's been a lot of issues and um, just changing the language makes a huge difference. Um, so far, yeah, the, the majority of projects were in Go. Um, there are obviously other languages used in CNCF now as well. There's some Rust code now and things like that. Um, but those haven't been ordered. Then we had the C and C++ pieces. So Envoy is written in C++, and Nats had a client written in C, um, which caused a lot of the issues we'll talk about in, in more detail. These things can be mitigated. Um, and there was also a bunch of issues around scope that we'll talk about. 
So let's look at core DNS first. Um, the most kind of exciting, aka critical vulnerability in core DNS was around caching. So um, core DNS has a caching plugin, and basically um, it, you can do a DNS lookup, and it'll, it'll look up on the authoritative DNS server, it'll come back, and it'll store the results. So it doesn't have to serve, go back and serve it. Uh, go back to the server later. But um, there was a problem actually with this that was kind of interesting in that it didn't check that the, when they asked, you know, if it, say you were asking the DNS server for a lookup for www.google.com, the caching plugin didn't actually check whether the um, DNS result that actually came back from the G Google's uh, DNS server was actually for www.google.com. It could have been for another address. And you think, well, that's not very likely, but um, if you can set, what it meant is that if you could um, make the code do a lookup for a DNS server you controlled, you could send back a bad result that gave, that pointed www.google.com at your infrastructure, say, which would be a very significant issue. So the moral of this is always, always validate user input, even if it seems bizarre that, you know, Google's name server's gonna come back with Google's DNS, but I mean, it's like not, it's not necessarily the case. So validation is incredibly important. We see a few more validation issues with other things later. Never trust input. Um, big takeaways from this, um, you know, it's a really well-written project. It uses a really, um, they don't actually implement their own DNS library. They use um, a, a Go DNS library that's really, really well-written and um, supports a lot of, um, a lot of, DNS protocol really, really well. Um, there's actually more, it's just one of the recommendations actually, there's more features in the DNS library that they could actually support around, um, around security features, around um, um, DNSSEC and things like that, which um, they could add. But, um, you know, they found it hard to find issues, which is great, that's what you want. It's, if it's difficult to find issues, um, they recommend though carrying on doing security related auditing to find things like the caching issue during development rather than kind of uh, at the end. So, you know, think about security all the way along as you're developing. Um, Containerd uh, didn't have any vulnerabilities and had one issue. Um, it was kind of, um, it's a really, it's a slightly weird issue. Um, it's just around the config file um, and it's really hard to see how it could be exploited. Basically, you can use it to create directories under different user IDs, but you're normally running it as root, so it's kind of not clear how significant it is. Um, so kind of, uh, but they kind of, I think, you know, they found something. But the biggest takeaway, I think, with Containerd was that it was not clear what the security scope really was. Containerd is in a really weird position in the stack, is it sort of sits in between Docker or Kubernetes and Run C, and it kind of, um, doesn't directly have obvious um, kind of security scope, but there are, I think, pieces that it would help to define, and I think that something that we at SIG Security could look at is looking at um, defining really what the security surface for Container D is. I think there are probably some, you know, potential bits around um, potential denial of service with, um, say, very large config files being sent in and things like that, which are potentially um, would come under um, container security scope. But just defining exactly what's in and what's out and why it's not a massively important critical bit is kind of important in order to get the most out of this sort of audit. Nats was the one that had the most issues numerically, I think. Um, and that's just a really simple protocol, so it's kind of nice to implement, but, um, uh, and they didn't find any issues with the Go or Java clients, for example, um, but they found a load of issues with the C client. Um, the, um, I mean, NERS has a C client because C is really easy to integrate with other languages. If you want to, say, a Python client or something like that, or anything like that, it's easy to integrate a C client. And so it obviously makes sense, but you, it's got, you know, it, it turned out to have a lot of issues and it's not clear really whether it's a good idea to, do, to, to have done that at all. Um, you know, even for a small, a small C implementation of a straightforward, simple protocol, 
Um, with small attack service, they found critical issues um, and less severe issues. So it's really, really problematic writing C. You have to be very, very careful if you want to have a secure C project that's safe for public consumption. And um, it's not impossible, but it's a lot of work. And it's, it's, you know, it's not like the people who are doing this were um, inexperienced C programmers or anything. I don't, as far as, you know, it's, it's just really, really hard. I mean, I was a C programmer for many years, and it's a horrible language to do things like parsing and things in, in string manipulation and things. It's just... It's really, really not very nice at all. Um, there are good reasons for having C code because of bindings. I think recently Rust has become a serious contender for writing uh, C bindings. Um, and it's definitely worth considering if you're doing something where it's, the aim is to Im implement the C ABI so you can implement it with other things. Uh, or consider writing native bindings for lots of languages. I know it's a lot of work, but you write a Python binding, a Ruby binding, a Node binding, whatever. It's like it's work, but it could be less work than writing it in C because the amount of time you're going to have to spend writing good C code is really, really hard. Um, so think about it, how much work's involved. Safety first. Use tooling. Fuzz testing is, fuzz testing is good for things like this. Um, use static and dynamic analysis tooling. There's a, there is a lot of tooling for C because it's been a problem for so long, so that's good. Portability is for the problems there because if you're writing Windows and Mac and Linux clients, for example, for things, um, that's actually three different environments you need to test, and they actually have different, you're probably using different libraries for a lot of stuff, so that, that's a bigger, you're effectively writing three versions of it anyway. Parsing in C is a nightmare, really try and avoid that if you can, uh, and audit. Envoy is kind of interesting because it's written in C++, not C, and C++ is a much better language from that point of view. Um, the biggest takeaway, actually, from the, from the issues was um, actually an issue that you see every now and again. The admin interface wasn't secure. Um, uh, and it was kind of not very well designed, the admin interface. It would accept commands from GET requests. So you could shut down, you could shut down Envoy with a GET request on the admin interface, um, which is kind of nasty. Admin interface is a really weird thing because like everyone says, oh, we must have a nice GUI for this, you know, and then someone puts something together in a, in a hurry and doesn't really think about it. I think it's better to not do an admin interface just because you want it to look nice in a demo. Either make a production quality one or don't do it at all and use the CLI. And like a halfway house of, it's kind of there, but it's not really there is um, really problematic. And I've seen this with other projects with admin interfaces as well. Um, uh, the Kubernetes admin interface was, had all sorts of problems historically as well. And, um, um, I, and most people are actually going to end up you know, configuring it through config files, command line, you know, that kind of thing, and not through the admin interface anyway. So is it worth having? Not sure. Um, C++, does it suffer the same problems as C? The answer is a little bit potentially but if you use it in a more sort of C-like way. The more you use C++ as modern, as the kind of modern C++, the less you have problems. You know, it has automatic memory management and things if you do it properly, but you can use it in other ways. And in the, the, the issues that were found were kind of that sort of thing. There was an in 32 overflow. Always, overflow is a bit of a pain in C sometimes. You have to be careful. Um, and a use after free, which again, if you use automatic memory management, it's not going to happen. Um, but the team were really good at actually using um, tooling to help find these issues. And actually, um, overall, the code base is, you know, was pretty good. It's a, it's, a large, it's a much larger code base than the sort of Nats C client by orders of magnitude. Um, and it had you know, not, not that many issues considering. So um, overall, yeah, C++ is fine. Don't worry about using that. Uh, Tough and Notary were ordered together. They're kind of not really terribly much to say. Both projects had previously had security audits, actually by one, at least one of them by the same company. Um, and um, not massively uh, large numbers of things had changed since the previous audit. So um, it wasn't hugely, um, like, you know, they dug into some of the issues that had come up before and things like that. Again, there was a small input validation issue that input validation is really, really important. And it's, um, but yeah, it was kind of, uh, kind of not, that one, not that interesting. 
Um, open policy agent, um, the, um, again, cross-site scripting issues on, on the query interface. Again, any time you do anything with a sort of, you know, REST API, HTML API, HTTP API, you need to be careful about um, unsanitized input, cross-site scripting, CSRF, all those things. There's a, you know, checklist of things, just go through it. It's pain, it's work, but it's understood. I just, you know, never, never trust the user input and make sure that you actually, you know, work out, you know, parse it carefully, work out if you're, if you're displaying what is untrusted input, make sure you sanitize it and so on based on where you are. I mean, it's, um, it's tedious and doable and, um, the other issue with Vapor that was kind of annoying was kind of put down as a documentation issue, but I think in a way it's actually more of a config language design issue. Um, a lot of people don't really think much about the configuration language and definitions of their code because it tends to, as you when you start a new project, you suddenly realize you need a config file because you, you have to stop hard coding the things you do when you write the first five lines of code. Um, so the problem with here was that um, you can put an authentication token in the config in order to, um, for access control, but just putting an authentication token in the config doesn't enable authentication, authorization in the, in the config. You actually have to uh, also turn it on explicitly, which is unexpected to say the least. It was thought if you put a token in there and you, then you don't turn it on, you know, the config parser could look at it and say, you've done something a bit weird there, or just you know, maybe it could just enable it if you put the token in. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, it's been put as a documentation issue, but I think just think about config language design when, you're, when, you're, when you start your configuration file. Just think about what, what, could a, what could a really dumb user do wrong or what could a user who hasn't read the documentation fully do by mistake and just think about, you know, could that, could that be an issue? Um, Prometheus. Now, Prometheus is a really interesting one. Again, we talked about scoping out what, um, what's in and what's out and what your project's trying to do and what it's trying not to do. And the entire audit basically ended up being extreme disagreement about scope. And all the issues said, no, this was flagged as a false alert and expected behavior by the Prometheus team. And, um, and there was a kind of longer comment, really, that... Um, they decided, the Prometheus team had decided that security and how you secure your Prometheus endpoints was out of scope and it's the user's problem to secure Prometheus endpoints, whereas um, the um, audit team decided that that, would, that was, no one would possibly make a bit of software in the modern age that didn't really think about securing endpoints. Um, and so in the end, um, the only outcome of this was a doc documentation PR, which basically s added some documentation saying uh, security is your problem. Um, now, it's a, it's a kind of complex issue, this, because in many ways, it's kind of reasonable. You want projects to be able to spend time working on the important things that matter to them, like making, you know, uh, uh, Making the things that makes Prometheus really valuable, really valuable, you know, making, you know, making logging incredibly successful. I mean, Prometheus has been extremely valuable for everyone, I think, and, and no one disagrees about that. But um, the complicated thing about Prometheus is that it's normally a sort of separate API with very different permissions to the rest of your API because it's being read um, by a sort of different process. It's not the it's not actually um, usually the same thing that's calling your API to actually do API operations. It's usually a completely separate process doing, um, you know, scraping the Prometheus endpoint. And so it's kind of, it, there's, there's actually reasonable arguments for having a sort of narrow, you know, a, a, at least a default kind of way of easily setting up authentication to that. Because if you've got it on a Prometheus endpoint on every single API endpoint on every machine you've got, on every service you've got. It's a lot of endpoints to have to write, a, you know, have to set up proxies or whatever other way of authenticating and maybe they could do something useful. I think, um, but my main kind of concern is, is the audit shouldn't have gone ahead without having decided on that escape before because effectively it was a total waste of money. 
um, because like they looked at some stuff, they disagreed, and uh, we got you know a dog's PR that you know really didn't justify the the amount of effort spent. So um, I think that as part of why we want to do security assessments in the, in, in the six security is that we can help iron out these issues before we go through all this and and really um, understand you know, what the scope is and document the scope up front so that, you know, we can then really focus on the actually important bits. So if you want to review, what should you do? Um, come and talk to SIG Security. Um, we'd really like to start with assessments where possible, if, unless you need an audit absolutely urgently. Um, and we can really help you be prepared for it and really not have the kind of issues around scope and, and, and deal with some of the overall architectural issues, help with your documentation and so on, do that first. So um, that would be, you know, that's a good place to start and then we can sort out the actual audit process. Um, there, as I said, the, there's more audits going on now and, you know, starting now. So there's, this process will be ongoing and hopefully we'll get all the projects in the CNCF down and also lots of candidate projects that want to join the CNCF and, and projects that want to move on to a new status. Um, and if you're interested in, all, in the whole process, come along to, um, you know, come along to SIG Security. All, the, all of this is happening, all our assessment stuff happens in public. The audits happen in private with the team because obviously they may find significant serious issues that need fixing so we can't, they can't, the process can't be public, but um, the way the process works is, you know, the, the team set up a Slack channel or email and they talk to the auditors and suggest things that they want to audit and things that might be at risk and discuss, you know, bounce forward things that they found and things as it, as it happens. And then, um, but then the, rep the final report is published after the issues have been fixed. Um, but with the assessments, because we're not doing pen testing, we're hopefully not finding massively important issues that we can do the whole process in public. So if you're interested in how this stuff works and, and, ha and in, or interested in the particular projects, then please come along and join in and participate. Um, and think about, you know, think about your threat models and so on first um, and really try and document everything and, you know, there's a bunch of tips for strengthening your code here. You know, don't trust your inputs. Be think about C. Um, use tooling to help you. Um, spend some time on the deep dive on security parts. Reviewing is incredibly important. Code review. Think about you know security as part of your code review process. Um, if you if you want someone to help you with code review on security critical parts, like say you're doing. You, a part of your code that um, maybe you're using cryptography or something and you're not sure if you're doing it right, come and talk to SIG Security. We can find someone, we can pull someone out who's got expertise in that area. Um, there's a, there's a bit, really big pool of people who participate in SIG Security, so we can come and you know, help you if you want to know how should you be doing something right. Um, and keep a list in the back of, you know, of the parts that you worry about. It's really helpful to like, have a sort of paranoia list of things that you think like, hey, I wrote this code, but I don't know if I really did it right, you know, or uh, maybe something could happen. And um, uh, when we were doing the notary and tough audits, I kind of, I passed my list to the auditors and they looked through it and they didn't find any issues with the bits I was paranoid about, which was reassuring um, because I knew that they'd spent some time digging into them and it, I was, you know, so my paranoia in that case was not particularly justified. But, you know, your paranoia can be justified. You can... There's, you know, there's lots of things where you think maybe there's something weird about this. Maybe there's something um, there'll be bits you haven't thought of as well. But, but it's always good to have a, a starting points to dig into. You know, audits can't cover everything. You know, it's, it would take months and months and months to go through every line of code and every interface, and especially with really big projects. So, um, you know. Uh, having some focus is really important. Um, and external reviews are a really valuable part of your security journey, and it's not often, I mean, a lot of this has happened in behind closed doors for, you know, closed source projects and things like that in the past, and it's not often that you get to see this sort of stuff happening so much in public, so I think there's a lot of things you can learn from, the, from those processes, which is really, really valuable. So, um, at this point, I take questions. <laughs> Got back a few minutes ago. Right? Yep. Is there a consistent sort of sense that you know the grasp of how secure each of the components are? Like were some of the comments around you know all four part test and then subsequently do issues were found in the core DMS test case like just the same project and other you know, the instances where the threat model wasn't provided, which complicated the issue. Do we have like a common view of just how much we trust each component? 
Um, so yeah, so the question is, do we have a common view of how much we trust each component because of, you know, based on the audience? Oh, oh we have got, we've got a mic here. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Um, um, yeah, we don't at the moment, and I think that's something that, um, again, that we've talked about with SIG Security, about putting together over time. It's, it's kind of difficult because the components do such different things. Um, you know, and I think that, um, um, yeah, the, the, you know, the difference between, you know, different parts of the stack. We, we're actually, we're putting together as a sort of a, um, a, um, kind of security landscape of projects, and we're trying to work out at the moment a sort of classification for the kind of things that things are. Like, are they, you know, are they part of, from the security point of view, are they part of the data plane or the control plane? Or, you know, what, what, when are they used? Are they used at build time or at production time? You know, so that we can try and group things into areas where they have similar or, or related thing. You know, there's a, obviously, there's a bunch of projects that the inputs and outputs flow through each other, like the container D case with Kubernetes container D to run C and things like that. So there's a kind of, there are definitely clusters and related things and flows and, and, and projects that have overlaps or projects that are alternatives that do the same, you know, that fill the same role in the stack and should be evaluated in the same way. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a bunch of really interesting work we can do on that over time. Is there an expectation that you all will provide security benchmarks for configuring all of the products that come out of the assessments? Um, benchmarks for configuring them, yeah. Um, uh, not yet, I think I'd say. I mean, I think, um, I think, um, in the short term, one of the things we want to look at is, thing, as, part, as part of the assessments, one of the things we want to look at is, how easy is it to not misconfigure things? Um, because that's, that can be a, a significant issue with a lot of things that you can just like totally leave it open because you uh, um, didn't turn on the, sec the secure button. Um, uh, but ideally things wouldn't have too many issues like that. I think that trying to work towards secure by default is better um, or just you have to configure that in order to run it at all, and you can't configure it. I mean, like, so it just won't run until you configure it to be secure. Um, I think, um, yeah, well, we're not, I don't think we're yet at the stage where we can provide detailed configuration advice for everything. There are some, um, the CIS benchmarks are kind of doing that for, for Kubernetes, um, and, um, but it, it, and that process is actually, I mean, I've, I've been involved in some of the Docker config for CIS benchmark process, and it's kind of um, good. It's quite a slow process, and it does change with, because the options change a lot through different releases and things, so it's, um, uh, but it doesn't address some of the things like why, why do we have to configure, why are those options there at all, and those kinds of things, which I think is also really important in actually hardening things by, by making the, the configuration better. And I think that is really something that's important. But yeah, we definitely, um, and we, if, if you want to, if you want things from SIG Security, please come and open an issue on our GitHub repo and we will try and uh, resource them. Are there any plans for SIG Security to look at Kubernetes distributions? So in the way that you get like a conformant Kubernetes distribution, is there any plan to say like SIG Security has looked at this and said, yeah, out of the box, it's not horrible? Because that's somewhere I see customers having quite a bit of confusion, you know, the different distributions and their, all their different settings. Um, I, we ha again, we haven't at the moment got um, on the roadmap, but it's, um, I mean, yeah, could definitely consider it. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, it's not on the right. It's more of a product. But yeah, it's a, security. Is, so we, we, yeah. we try to address the issues that he shows us yeah. by modifying our product to not be able to present that issue to you anymore. There's more than, than a recommendation to the users of the product. 
Yeah, I mean, I think so some of it's, I mean, if you, some of it is, a, is arguably the distribution's responsibility, but if they want to work on common tooling, for example, to help, that would be really valuable. Um, so, yeah, there's, um, it would definitely, you know, it, it would be nice if, the, if some of the distributions started working with us to work on things like that. Uh, is there any chance to uh, get a run C reviewed as well? So run C is not a CSA project, but uh, for Kubernetes security and continuity and cryo, uh, run C is still important. Yeah, I think, I mean, run C, the OCI is, is sort of a, a sibling organization of CNCF, so I think we can probably, uh, we should definitely um, consider it in scope, I think, because it's, it's a sort of historical anomaly that runs the as an OCI project, not a CNCF project, and it's the only non, it's the kind of non-spec part of the OCI, and it would make, I mean, I, it would make more sense if it, if run C was in CNCF, so yeah, I think, um, I think it could definitely be considered in scope, um, and it's definitely part of the Kubernetes security story is the bit that is run C, because it's, you know, everyone's running, well, run C or an equivalent piece, and you can't really consider Kubernetes security without, or container do security for that matter, without really considering the, the run C, the actual runtime piece as well. So yeah, I think it would definitely be weird to exclude it. Um, with the pen test being very much point to time, is there any consideration given to like a, like a, uh, oh, <laughs> I can't remember the word, um, like a, a program for um, community finding bugs, um, a bug bounty program, and would that be something that the individual projects would have to look after, or would it be at the CNCF level? There's, um, there's, uh, it's still, there's, there's a um, proposal with the Linux Foundation and Netflix and a few other people that there was a talk about at DockerCon in the security sig there uh, that we were, they were that Netflix. Um, and Linux Foundation are interested in supporting a bug bounty for, con for container escape. Um, obviously, container escape is a pretty, like, it's, it's one kind of narrow thing, but it's also one incredibly important thing and covers the Linux kernel and things like that. So it's why the Linux Foundation core is kind of involved as well as just CNCF. So um, the, the plan is to try and implement that this year. Um, it, there's, a, there's actually, there's a bunch of work. If you, there, there, there's, there's a very short talk which is in the um, SIG security video from DockerCon, which um, you should definitely watch from, um, net, from the Michael at Netflix. So that's happening, and I think that hopefully can set a precedent for bug bounties for other parts of the stack, potentially. I don't think it's something that um, is being worked out yet, but I think it's, it's a definitely a really positive starting point towards that. Um, and, you know, start with the, the big, dangerous, con, you know, container escape is a really, like, huge thing, and there's been, you know, it's not, it's um, definitely an area worth hardening, but I think obviously there are huge other areas where bug bounties could be, could be valuable, but I think um, there's also a bunch of, um, I think, work that needs to be done helping projects actually run their security fun function as well, because some projects have really, um, mature security function because they, have, you know, they're big and they have a big security team like Kubernetes. But some of the other CNCF projects are like young and not have never had a CVE yet, and it's like they're just going down the beginning of this road. And I think they need, they they probably need help on that function before they get bug bounties on their code. So, you know, there's a sort of maturity level thing around bug bounties as well. But but it's definitely, um, yeah, it's definitely something that's at least happening for part of the space. Um, so the, or so I had a question about that helped a little bit with the hi over here, <laughs> hi Justin. Um, so I had a question about uh, new projects. One of the things that Cure Fifty Three had put out for one of the projects was um, the suggestion for ongoing security audits for these projects. Um, I was curious to hear from perhaps other projects or what other people are doing for these ongoing security audits. Like, is that part of the PR process? Is that something that's being done, like security scanning through uh, external vendor tools, or is uh, this some other process that, uh, when people are going down the security audit trail, like what can they do to make their systems more secure and um, going through that process? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of um, tooling and things. Mean, I mean, I think that come, come to Six Security and we can help you with your with what you're doing and what you're not doing. I think would be the I think because we're kind of out of time. But that, yeah, there's a load of tooling that you can use to help you. Um, the, um, you know, there's a whole lot of automated, um, you know, code analysis tooling. Uh, there's a whole bunch of race condition testing tooling. You know, all, a lot of um, a lot of issues are kind of, um, um, you know, there's kind of there's lots of different kinds of issues, and obviously things like um, maintaining dependencies and things like that is also really important. So yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that we can help with. I think we're. Out of, I think I've been told to leave. <laughs> um. <laughs>